I think our society currently is using being overworked and burned out as a badge of honor. If I'm not working 80 hours a week, I'm not doing what I should be doing. And mm. we as a company, and I think us personally, think it's time to try to do things differently. This is not the way that we want to live our lives. Uh, and this is not the way we want our employees to live their lives. Because yeah, it just leads to burnout. And when you're burnout, you actually don't do anything. I'm Ron Jor, and this is Remake, a podcast about design, systems, and society. In each episode, I talk to someone who's trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way, whether through a new product, new venture, or a new way of looking at the world. And I try to understand how they came to it, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from them. Today, I'm talking to Anna Ferreira and Alex Munch. Anna is head of design and product design, and Alex is a senior digital product designer at Doist, a completely remote team of over 100 people and the maker of popular productivity apps to Doist and Twist. Anna and Alex are the creators of Twist, a remarkable and opinionated communication tool aimed at replacing Slack with a less distracting, more focused, supporting, less real-time alternative. We've been using Twist for a few months at Remake, and it has done wonders for our ability to communicate remotely across time zones, to stay up to date, and catch up when our work allows rather than disrupting work to be always connected. I really can't overstate how much more harmonious and effective work has become since we moved out of real-time chat tools. And a lot of this goes back to Anna and Alex's ideas and the company's opinionated take on work, communication, and design. We also talk about what it means to be a designer, what makes Doist special as a company, what's wrong with always-on team chat tools like Slack, Microsoft Teams, and Google's Team Chat, and the culture of availability and distraction they promote, and what it takes to be an effective distributed team. This chat with Anna and Alex is just one of dozens of great weekly interviews we have lined up for you with leading designers, best-selling authors, activists, impact investors, and entrepreneurs who are trying to change our lives for the better in some meaningful way. So if you haven't done so already, please follow us on your favorite podcast player to make sure you don't miss them. And now, let's jump right in with Anna Ferreira and Alex Munch from Doist. All right, I'm sitting here with Anna Ferreira and Alex Munch from Doist. Alex and Anna, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here. All right. Thanks for having us. So the first question these days usually has to do with COVID. And so I'd love to hear, first of all, in your respective places, how you experienced COVID and then to hear how it affected, if at all, your work because you're working for a place that's fairly remote forward, remote positive. So Anna, let's start with you. Sure. Yeah, I feel bad complaining when so many people have to face like real problems during the last 18 months. Uh, I'm very privileged. I was already working remotely. Uh, I have a nice house with a home office, everything. The finances were stable. But yeah, I wish nothing of this had happened and that the world was still normal and that we could live and go out and meet my colleagues, for example, which we are not able to do right now. Yeah. Where in the world are you based? I'm in Porto, Portugal. Nice. Yeah, and it's a town that's famous for a lot of good places to eat and a nice, nice atmosphere. Yeah, definitely. Right now, we are going back to the normal life. Like now I'm fully vaccinated, so I can start to do things, but still trying to go to outdoor seatings and things like that instead of the normal restaurants and going to concerts or whatever. Yeah, yeah. We're the same here. Alex, how is it, how is it for you? Yeah, similarly. So professionally, like Anna, it hasn't uh, affected me because we are already working remotely since ever, since the beginning of Doist. So yeah, there's not really a big change in how we work and how we communicate. We are just seeing how other people 
adopt the similar work style that we have already established for ourselves, which is very interesting. And it's also a good opportunity for us, for the company to teach others uh, what the best ways are to work remotely, best practices, giving some tips, which is also something we focus on as a company. And yeah, personally, it did affect me, of course, uh, because yeah, I have family around the world. So my sister, for example, was in the US mm. and you constantly worry about her and all the circumstances. And yeah, it wasn't easy, but yeah, I don't really want to complain for myself here. Yeah. Yeah. One of my early interviewees, uh, Kathy Davis said the, the thing that I loved about this, she's like, I can't complain, but I really want to, which I think captures everyone's mood these days. And so you mentioned the Duist is trying to teach others how to work remotely. Do you want to talk about anything that the Duist has done during COVID to help other companies or help other people figure out uh, this remote thing that you're apparently doing so well? Yeah, right in the beginning of the pandemic, when everyone was sent home and was forced to work remotely, we did some um, open office hours. So lots of people at Duist opened up their calendars to have quick conversations, like 15 minutes, half an hour with people that were looking for help. Because yes, we've been doing this since the beginning. I've been doing this since I joined the company in 2013. So yeah, we have a lot of experience. So that is one of the ways that we try to help the community and everyone around us. Also talking with friends, giving tips and things like that. We also have some remote guides online that teach or try to help people to work remotely in different areas. So we have one for design, for engineering. We have lots of different areas. So if you want, you can also look that up and try to get some ideas on how to do it better. Cool. And Juist is a very opinionated company and we'll get to your tools and your opinions on how to do remote work also reflects in your tools in, in interesting ways. I would love to explore that a little bit further. But first, we have this opening question that I, I love to ask to get to know the person that I'm talking to. And because we have two people, this is my first time doing like a panel, then I will ask each of you in turn. And I'll start with Anna. What's something you've learned early in life that still drives you in your work today? One thing. Don't be afraid to try new things. Uh, how did that, what was the occasion for learning that? When I was young, I was always trying to do new things, trying different areas where I could, I don't know, draw, try new techniques, whatever it was. But mm. especially since university, we had to do a project. I don't even remember exactly what the project was, but I decided to code a website and I was studying um, communication design. And that is mm. basically how my life, my life turned to interaction <laughs> design and all that. And it was basically because I decided, okay, a website would be cool. Let's yeah. try to code it. And I was still coding in text edit with HTML, CSS, all that. But it was a very fun experience. And from there, I became a web designer, if that's what we called it back then. And mm. yeah, then with friends, I tried doing mobile apps. And that's what led me to do it as well. So yeah, trying new things. Cool. Alex, what's your thing you learned early in life that still drives you today? I would say be more decisive and also follow your passion. Mm. For example, I always knew that I wanted to do something visual, a visual craft, something with art, something with design. And yeah, I tried different areas like working in advertising agencies. And I learned that it just isn't the type of work I want to do. And uh, regarding my passion, yeah, I in the early days of the iPod, I was really obsessed with it and was like uh, amazed by all the apps and what they can do. They can basically help you during the, your day. They can manage everything that you do. And yeah, I was trying to see how I can do this with technology and design. So mm. I was really into product design at that time. I didn't study it. I, I started the basic communication design. But then, yeah, my passion led me to my current job, which is product design. Yeah, and I don't want to miss it. 
Cool. So making decisions and sticking to them and, and following your passion. I love these answers. So question to both of you. Anna, what is a designer? How do you define someone who's a designer? What's uh, I struggle with this a, a lot. That's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a hard one. I think it's someone that tries to create things that helps users' lives in some mm. way. So we are not doing what the company wants us to do sometimes. We are actually trying to improve the users' lives in doing what we do. Interesting. Uh, that's a good definition. Alex, how do you think about this? I think almost everyone is a designer. For example, if you think about everything that you interact with and that you see is mm. designed by someone, for example, the streets, how they work, how the sidewalk is positioned, how big it is, is it compatible for every kind of person that wants to use it? So someone designed this and they designed it either in a good way to use it or in a bad way. So yeah, everything that you interact with in life is basically yeah, designed. Yeah. And if you think about, okay, this doesn't work for me and I want to find a way and uh, an idea how to improve this, you're basically um, starting to become a designer because you're thinking about the problem and how to solve it. And yeah, how to solve it is yeah the the difficulty that we try to do with our craft. I started realizing that there's some sort of continuum between a designer and an engineer. We're not really different things. It's almost like we have a different focus, but we often work side by side and we're looking at the same problem, but just from a slightly different perspective. And so I started thinking maybe we're just engineers of human experiences. Maybe what what we're doing is exactly what like what they're doing, but we are concerned with the human experience and they are concerned with the software and the computer's experience. And we have to work together to make it happen. And we have our tools, like they have an understanding of computer science and how memory works and, and coding. And we have observation and empathy and, and creativity and we have our tools. So it's interesting. So when did you first know that you were a designer, that you wanted to keep doing this for life. And we'll start with Anna. I went to the university to study communication design because I thought it was funny to design logos, which is the mm. thing I hate the most right now. I think it was like middle of university that I realized that I actually liked. And this goes with the thing that you mentioned, that we are like a little bit of engineers as well. So I like the mix of code and design. And mm. I think that's when I decided that this is something I could do for the foreseeable future. Because yeah, I didn't need to just focus on one of the areas. I could also go into the other a little bit if I wanted to. Cool. And and Alex, you started talking about how you were playing with the, with the apps and you kind of were really into it. When did you realize, huh, I'm a designer now. Like, this is what I want to do. So what I was doing is I worked on an app that was solving a personal problem for myself. So I I built it like I designed it and I asked an engineer to build it, bring it to life. And this kind of feeling when you can interact with something that you designed and mm. it's just working and it's like you're in your imagination was like, okay, this is amazing. I want to do this probably for a longer time. Cool. So I want to talk about coming to work for Doist, which for both of you happened several years ago. And so, Anna, I would love to hear what were you doing right before Doist and what was the process like of, uh, of joining the team? I was working in um, educational software for kids in Portugal. But mm. what led me to do it was actually a side project, uh, which was a list app, which connects a lot with Todoist, that both me and the current head of iOS or Apple at Todoist were working on. And that's what led us to Doist, both of us, basically. So cool. we decided to do a personal project with a couple of friends. That's what led me to mobile design. I was focusing mostly on web design before that. And mm -hmm. that's where you learn Apple coding for Apple devices. And then we found out, he found out first that 
Duist was looking for his first iOS developer because before that it was mostly freelancers. And once they needed a designer, he asked me if I wanted to join. So mm. he approached me like, hey, this is Todoist. Do you want to try it? And I pick up his phone. I was trying to use it. I couldn't even edit a project. And I was like, this is terrible. <laughs> this should be better. <laughs> and so a couple nice. of months later, I applied to her Get Doist. I had an interview with Amir. And yeah, and eventually we dropped our side project because we were getting the fix the daily fix yeah. of working in a list app at Todoist and with Todoist. Yeah. So I have this vague memory of Todoist many years ago. Was it working in a browser? Was it almost a week view that you had to click into to add a task to each day in the week or something? I had something like that running the browser ages ago, like more than 10 years ago. I don't know. <laughs> Don't I don't think so. <laughs> 10 years ago, we only had the web app. I joined yeah. in 2013, so eight years ago, more or less. Okay. And we okay. already had a mobile app that was designed and coded by freelancers. Okay. I don't know if all of them actually saw the light of day. Some of them were only internally available for doisters and... I don't remember that personally. Maybe it was, yeah. but from the screenshots I see from like 2007 when Amir created, yeah. I don't remember that interaction. But when was the company started? Because I I seem to remember around 2008, I was like looking for to do list tools, and I found this web based thing that I think was the the very early version of Todoist. Probably it was. Yeah, and it only had one feature. Yes. Amir started it as a personal project in 2007. So he was trying to find okay. a way to organize himself, like school life, freelancer life and all that. He couldn't find anything. So he decided to create his own tool. And yeah, that's where it all started. I might be one of your first users ever, because I remember trying this out and it was like, it was just a basic to-do list, like on the web. Yes. Okay. Cool. That's nice. But today, Todoist, you're 93 people. So I read this, 93 people, 41 nationalities, 39 countries in 75 cities. So you are fully distributed. When did you join in that process? How many people were there when you joined? I don't just remember the exact number. I think we were less than 10. I was probably hmm. employee eight or nine or something like that. So no. very early on. Yeah, compared to the growth, for sure. Cool. And Alex, what was your story? What were you doing right before and what was joining like? So right before joining Duist, I was actually finishing my university. During university, I was already freelancing as a graphic designer. But the final project at university was my side project app that I wanted to bring to life. And I was looking for an engineer, an iOS engineer, and I met Enric, who is an iOS developer at Duist. So we worked on this. He worked on this as a side project. And for me, it was my university project. And he was working in Menorca and I'm in Germany. So we were already working remotely and together and on an app that is solving problems. And yeah, so I got to learn also to do this. So I was using it for my daily uh, reviews and uh, organization. Yeah, right after uh, I finished university, I was looking for a job for a like more permanent job. And yeah, I got in contact with Amir on Twitter. And yeah, we just talked and somehow I landed at Duist. I think we were 30 people at that time in 2015. So very small company at that time. Cool. Very cool. So let's talk about Duist as an opinionated company, which it definitely is or seems to be from everything you put out there. From the start, kind of working as a team without borders, trying to find the best people from anywhere in the world, putting, work, I don't want to call it work-life balance. You call it supporting a well-lived life, which I like, and, and choosing ambition and balance. So you talk about we can be ambitious without destroying our personal lives. And, and then you're also very opinionated about how you do work and how best to do work. Yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit about that. What's Where is this coming from? What are these principles and how do they express themselves? 
Yeah, I can start. I think our society currently is using being overworked and burned out as a badge of honor. If I'm not working 80 hours a week, I'm not doing what I should be doing. And mm -hmm. we as a company, and I think us personally, think it's time to try to do things differently. This is not the way that we want to live our lives. Uh, and this is not the way we want our employees to live their lives because yeah, it just leads to burnout. And when you're burnout, you actually don't do anything. You just want to lay in bed and yeah, I think that's it. So we are very opinionated because we believe that in order for people not to have to work 80 hours a week, we need to have focus time every day to do the real work. If we spend the entire day in meetings or getting constant notifications, for example, we don't actually have the time to do the work. So mm. are we supposed to work after hours to do the design that we are supposed to deliver if we spend eight hours just in meetings? That mm. doesn't work. So we try to find that balance. And that's why we default to asynchronous communication, which I think that's where we become even more opinionated. We try to reduce right. the number of meetings. Of course, there are things for which meetings are extremely necessary for the social interaction, for example, for one-on-ones. It's also great to have meetings, but most of the decisions can actually be made asynchronously in a written format. Mm -hmm. And that's how we believe that this is the future of work because it also allows us to work with people from everywhere in the world. You mentioned that we work from 33 countries. And yes, that includes from Australia to the West Coast of the United States and Canada. So the time difference yeah. is huge. And you can't include everyone in decisions with the time difference if you don't do this asynchronously. Yeah. Yeah, and you're not the only company to say this. There's quite a few. There's Automatic, there's the Basecamp folks. A lot of them are talking about working asynchronously. And, and I think that there's also maybe a shared commitment to having a personal life, right? That's what forces you to come up with these solutions. Because other companies, it just leaks and leaks into your evenings and weekends. And the work gets done, right? If the company is not committed to not taking over the, the employee's life, then... That's where it goes. But I, I want to challenge a little bit this uh, asynchronous ideology, which I think is core to, you know, at least one of your products and it's core to how you run your company. How do you do like basic things like stand-up meetings or where the goal is to unlock other people if they're stuck, right? And stay synced as a team to make sure that we're supporting each other. So how does that work? We don't have them. Right. Okay. <laughs> So basically, we have weekly meetings for each team normally, but it's mostly a way for us to see each other more than share what we are actually doing, because that we do asynchronously on Twist, where all the other teams can also go in and check. So every Monday, we have two design meetings, one in the morning in Europe and the other in the afternoon, because it's impossible to get everyone together. And here we say what we are doing, what we will be doing, if we have any uh, special request from anyone and stuff like that. But it's mostly a way for us to see each other's faces because we won't see each other for the rest of the week because all the same information is also present on Twist. So we also catch up a bit on how was the weekend, all that, like the social part of the interaction because... Then we work uh, in monthly cycles and each designer or each person in the company is part of one project. And within this project, sometimes they have weekly meetings or not, most of the times not. And what we do is post everything on Twist. So this is what I did last week. And this is what I'm going to do this week. But the daily stand-up meetings that many companies do uh, that are there to try to remove like the blocks that some people may have. What we do is if we have a blog, we post it on a twist instead of waiting for the daily meeting to say what the block is. So for mm -hmm. example, if I'm designing something and I need the feedback from the 
Android team, for example, instead of waiting for the next morning, because those meetings usually take place in mornings, uh, I will just ping the person that I need a reply from mm. in Twist. And whenever they are working, because they may not be working at that moment, or they may be doing their focus work, they will reply to me with an answer. And that's okay. why we also always have a secondary, the smaller tasks that we can do in case we get blocked. Because we know that asynchronous communication is great. Working with people from everywhere is amazing. But yes, it makes communication slower. And we know that. And we are willing to do the trade-offs. Yeah. I guess one main challenge that I see here, and we'll get into Slack in a bit, but one of the things that is that all the other tools default to is interrupting you with a notification for everything. And I guess if I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, I will say that one thing that is good about that is it doesn't require a lot of habits and a lot of discipline. If I know that I can send it directly to someone or ping them in a channel and they will feel like everyone is seeing something you said about them and they have, so it, it almost forces them to act right then. Are there more in your process as a, first let's talk about on a company level, are there more habits that individuals have to form for the process to work, like checking in the blockers or checking in the channels? How do you see that? We have a rule of thumb, which is to reply to everything within 24 hours, which means that we can get an answer for everyone like in the world, basically. And that's right. why the 24 hours exist, which means that everyone, of course, will check Twist, which is our communication tool every single day but they don't need to be checking it every single minute. You can organize your life as you are more productive or your work as you are more productive. Yeah. So it's the asynchronous system in addition to this rule of you have 24 hours to reply to, yes. to make sure that you're not blocking other people. That's really interesting. So yeah, let's talk about a Slack. So Slack, the last report I heard that they were over 10 million daily active users more than 600,000 businesses are using them in around the world, 150 countries. You know, if you don't know what Slack is, most of our users probably are on Slack, but if you don't know, right, it's, it's a chat tool that, that is essentially the core of a company's conversation. And recently they got acquired by Salesforce. And this is actually just it finalized just a couple of weeks ago for $27.7 billion. So clearly they're huge. What's wrong with what they do? So in a broader sense, there are channels and you, you can create as many channels as you want for different teams, etc. And there's chat, real-time chat inside those channels. What's wrong with that? From my perspective, it's promoting synchronous Chat. If you are a remote company, you, you can't really communicate at the same time all the time. Some people are sleeping, you are working, you can't ping them when they're sleeping. This results in communication that is a bit messy because some people need to catch up and you have like a constant stream of new messages, new conversations are starting in the same window. You can't really see where the new topic is starting, where it ends, where mm -hmm. has a decision been made. It just gets very messy and also addicting and yeah, FOMO, fear of missing out. You constantly try to check what's new, where can I give my input, something like this. So right. these are really the problems that we faced when using Slack and we try to solve it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's always this feeling as a, what's, what are people saying behind my back? What decisions are being made without me? I have to be constantly available. Otherwise things will get locked in and decided and I won't have a voice and it's constantly interrupting you, even if you're, you, you call it addiction, but even if you're, you know, if you have notifications on, then it's constantly interrupting you and, and breaking your concentration. If you are in do not disturb mode, you feel guilty. You feel like you, there's something that might be going on without you that you can't really check. And I find that it works okay for teams that are in the same time zone and relatively small. So it's not active all the time. But once a company is like 30 people or more, it's already, it's nonstop. So did Twist kind of arise out of a response to Slack or what was the impetus to start working on Twist? 
we were using Slack as an internal communication tool. And mm. what we started to feel was that we didn't have weekends, we didn't have nights because we were getting notified. We had all the catch up words for design, for Anna, for everything, because I was afraid that I would miss my chance to speak up in a decision because once a decision is, has been made, it's really hard for you to go back and say, hey, remember that conversation that you reached the conclusion 10 hours ago? I totally disagree. Let's go back to it. Right. Because right. the Slack is just a flow of conversation. There isn't any focus on the conversations that you have. So it jumps pretty quickly right. from lunch to uh, design to something else. So. Everyone at the company was feeling this. In the beginning, it was great because we are a remote company and it was a chance for us to get to know each other. But after a couple of months, it was, okay, this is too much. I can't handle this. So there must be a better way to work. And so, yeah, because Todoist also started as a um, tool to fulfill the needs of Amir. Twist started as a need to fulfill the needs of the company itself as we were growing because it was no longer mm. possible to just rely on emails, Todoist and Slack because, yeah, we needed our own time too. Cool. Yeah, that sounds very familiar, that description of what Slack does to, to the culture. And, and the worst is that some companies just say, fine, this is our culture now, and they embrace it totally. What was your process as you went about, okay, designing twist and, and, and redesigning communication? What was some of the guiding principles and how did you start? We started with a couple of principles that we had in mind at the time, which was transparency, which are also the principles for the company or transparency. So defaulting to have everyone having access to everything, being able to have a voice in the discussions, focused threads with the specific topic. So one thread, one topic, we reach a conclusion and that's it. We can move on to the next one. Uh, but while the thread mm. is open, everything follows more or less the same guidelines or it's about the same subject. And I think those were the biggest two things and the ability to disconnect. Yes. Yeah. So when you say the ability to disconnect, how does that express itself? In the it expresses itself by not getting notified all the time. Uh, by default, mm. the application only doesn't notify you. So you need to actually say, I want to get notified about stuff. Also, mm. instead, so we have channels and channels have people. But instead of notifying everyone in a single channel, when we are discussing something, we can choose to just notify the correct person. So if the three of us are having a conversation, but in that specific point, I just need an answer from Alex, uh, I don't need to add you there. Uh, so only Alex will see the unread dot and knowing that there is more content there for him to see. So even the unread symbol is only going to be seen by the relevant people. I could still see the thread, but it's not highlighted for me. Yeah, exactly. If you're not notified, and notified doesn't mean that you get a notification. It means that you are added as a destination, like in the email field, to receive that message. Mm. So if you're not there, you won't see it as unread. You can still see it if you want to, but it won't be marked as unread. It will only be marked as something new for the person that was notified that didn't necessarily receive the notification, a push notification. Interesting. So I'd love to hear, did you have any, and I'm opening this to both of you, uh, do you have any influences in your thinking about how to redesign were there any articles or any research or anything like that kind of influence how you design things? So when I was exploring how Twist could look like, I was thinking about established patterns and products that work in a similar way. So mm. for example, email is a good example. So we decided, for example, to don't have online or offline indicators. So this means you have to trust people and find the people you can trust to work with and to deliver their work. and. Yeah, we were thinking about the general structures. So as Anna mentioned, uh, transparent channels. So 
everyone in the company can join a channel and you have a, a list like in like an email you have one topic not the sender but yeah. the topic is at the top the subject of the thread and yeah we were trying to borrow existing patterns from communication apps that could fit to our product the best and then combine them in one cool but what about research because there's a lot of research that actually backs up what you've done with the cost for instance of losing focus and how switching context actually saps your ability to focus did you look at any of that in designing or was it just like from mostly from personal experience of experiencing these things we looked at a couple of studies about yeah the how much time it actually requires you to go back to the same task if you get interrupted. So it's not just the five minutes that it takes for you to reply. It's also all the other time that you need to go back to the previous mindset and things like that. But we didn't do a huge research. We knew some of these Mm. things. We looked for a couple of studies and then we designed it as we needed for ourselves, basically. It was, uh, Mm. if we need this, probably other people will need this too, or other companies. Yeah. So this started as a dog food kind of situation where you actually started by using it yourself. And then after a certain point, decided to release it to other people. What was the first iteration? What were the first changes as you started using it? I think the first version didn't have DMs, if I'm not mistaken. So we only had threads. Mm. And basically, after one year of development, we decided to move the entire communication to twists, like really dog fooding our own products. And it was like, okay, you will stop using everything else and you will just use this. Everyone was crying um, because the product wasn't polished. It was web only. So it meant that we couldn't mm. actually use it very well on mobile devices. And it lacked the ends. So mm. That's one of the things, for example, that were added in the product after we started testing it, because we still needed quick ways to just chat about stuff or to quick ping ping someone to ask a specific question that had absolutely no influence on the company itself. Yeah. I love that story because releasing it to the whole company and forcing them to use it, that really puts some pressure on having to get things right quickly. So I'm, I'm guessing like there was like, you felt the pain of, oh, do we do a mobile client now or do we do this? Or, you know, all these requests are suddenly really urgent. We are already working in some of the mobile clients, but they were delayed compared to the web client. So we couldn't mm. use it unless it was in the browser, but it wasn't responsive. So yeah, it was very difficult to use it on the mobile, on your phone. So once you released it, what was your go-to-market? And then I'd love to hear what were the reactions? We initially aimed to, our market was other remote companies because we felt Mm. that Slack isn't a bad product. Uh, It just doesn't fit the needs of everyone. And it certainly doesn't fit the needs of a remote company with people uh, across the world because, yeah, it's impossible to disconnect. It's impossible to voice your opinion and all that, as we mentioned before. So we thought remote companies, those are our target market. The feedback was good. We still don't have a lot of users But the people that actually get, because Twist is more than a product, is a different workflow, a different way of working. And Mm. so it also implies this mindset shift. So we need to change the way that we think in order to be able to work with Twist. So we need to educate more our users than we are currently doing in order for them to really grasp the need of such a tool. Also, yeah. I think in the last 18 months, probably also some people also realized all the limitations from the way that they are currently working because some people had kids at home, so they couldn't just focus on everything. And some companies were still demanding them to reply within five minutes. And maybe you were just helping your kid or you're cooking or you are actually focused and doing your work. So I think more and more people are realizing the value of async communication. And that's also Mm. why we are working on a new version of Twist uh, that we help hope it will fix even more of the user needs. Cool. Yeah. I'd love to hear about this new version. 
what's what's coming. It will be released later this year. We can't talk a lot about it, but it tries to simplify some of the user's pain points that we got from interviews. It tries to simplify the interface and also keeping you more focused on the thing that you are trying to do instead of mm. overwhelming you with all the information that you have on Twist. Interesting. Very cool. So there, there's a certain value to being a contrarian because I think you land in really interesting things. And I think um, the 37 Signals folks wrote about this in WeWork, like have an enemy or have like the empire. If you're a Jedi, have the, something that you're trying to be not like. And I think people love Slack very often when it works for them, but a lot of people feel that burn that you're describing and that feeling of just, like, it's almost like, Slack is the Facebook of work. It's, it's the thing that takes over your life and prevents you from doing what you want to be doing. And so and it's even worse than email. With email, we can, we, at least we have the ability to say, okay, I'm going to ignore this for a week. Yeah, I've been seeing more and more people complain about how they feel when they hear the Slack new message sound. It's like, oh no, not again. So I yeah. think people are starting to realize that maybe this isn't the way that they want to work. Yeah, yeah. Let's hope that the more and more people realize that and that we have more great tools like Twist. So as an ending question, we usually ask this question and I'll give each of you a chance to answer. So in his TED Talk, the philosopher Alain de Botton talks about the difference between a lecture and a sermon. And he says a lecture is this modern invention. It's there to give you a little bit of information. It's very sterile. And a sermon is urgently trying to change your life in some way. And, you know, it's from a place of caring and, and it's more intimately and more urgently trying to change your life. We talk to all sorts of people, but in this case, let's limit it to, to product designers and designers. What's your short sermon for these people that could change their approach to work and life? And uh, Anna, let's start with you. Uh, protect your own time because no one else will do it. Nice. Do you want to el elaborate on, on that a little bit? What does that mean to protect your own time? The time that we have is limited and we have lots of things that we want to do and that we need to do. And if we don't protect our time by accepting all the meeting requests, by accepting to be disturbed when someone wants to disturb you, it means that your time will not be protected and you will need to use time that maybe you prefer to go to the gym, just read a book, whatever it is. And you will need to use the time that you had saved for other, maybe more important things to actually do the things because someone else decided that you should spend your time doing what they wanted you to do. Just because mm. someone asks you to be in a meeting, it doesn't mean that you need to be there, for example. Yeah. That's a great one. Alex, what's your short sermon? I would say you'd be surprised how effective written communication is as opposed to meetings. So many people have this urge to just quickly talk about something and uh, discuss ideas. But if you're forced to write something down and really think about how you communicate your idea, your different um, options that you want to present to someone like design variations, you think more about your own process. And during writing, you maybe give yourself feedback already and you're solving the problem during your own thinking time yourself. So yeah, it gives you a lot of time to um, reflect. And um, yeah, I would love if people, more people would think more about just solving problems and communicating first in a written way and then mm -hmm. If there's really no no other way uh, to solve something um, that's very complex, ask for a meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Alex, for your time today. Yeah, thank you very much. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed the podcast and would like to support it, please consider writing a five-star review in Apple's podcast app or wherever you're listening. It helps many more people discover the podcast and also makes us feel good. Current support for the podcast comes from my own design company, Remake Labs. 
Uh, we run design sprints all over the world, um, and our goal is to improve outcomes, whether in business or uh, various organizations, through repeated and rapid design interventions. Now, until next time, be well, everyone. See you next week on Remake.